Hey there, thanks so much for tuning in to this message from Faith Community. While you're here, let us know where you're joining from in the comments and share anything that sticks out to you throughout the message. We hope you're encouraged and inspired to move from where you are to where God wants you to be. But today we are uh, still continuing our Advent series. This week we're talking about joy. Advent is a season to slow down, right? Bring it, bring it to a slower pace. We typically go busy, 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 but slow down and focus on Jesus that he's come and that he's coming again. Right? And what does it look like for Jesus to be present right now, today, and into 2021, and looking forward, as Paul said, to when he comes again and we fully possess that perfection for which he purchased for us? So we've talked about hope, hoping when there's no reason to hope. We've talked about peace where there is no peace. And today, we're going to talk about joy as we crack open Ruth 3. Now, if you've missed any of it, you can go online and pick it up. But Ruth is the story of Naomi and Ruth. And Naomi finds herself with her husband Elimelech and her two sons at the beginning of the story in Bethlehem. But they're experiencing severe famine and they decide to leave to go to Moab to to get food. They, They leave because they don't have anything. But while they're in Moab, her sons marry Moabite women, which is not permit permitted by God, but her husband dies and her two sons die, and she's left as a widow by herself with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, and they decide to go back to Bethlehem to try in some way to put together a life which they can live. Now, they are completely destitute, completely vulnerable. It's the worst situation possible that a woman or women could find themselves in being widowed and having nothing to provide for them. Chapter 2 opens up, and they discover that there is this man named Boaz who's a close family relative. And in that culture, God had created this concept of a redeemer that if a a husband passed away, then the closest relative, be that a brother, an uncle, a cousin, would step in, redeem her, pay for the land, take take away the debt, all of that. And Ruth just so happened to find herself in Boaz's field, and Boaz is a family Redeemer, and she, uh, ver, uh, chapter two ends with Ruth being and Naomi being cared for and provided for, and Boaz taking extra consideration for them. But chapter three, kind of the story begins to turn a little bit. But before we move on, I want to define joy. Like, what is joy? What is joy? What is the the tension of joy? Joy isn't a, a, just a feeling that we feel. It's not some emotion that comes and, and then it goes. It's not really rooted in our circumstances or our situations. It's not happiness. The root word of happiness is happen, right? right? And it's contingent upon what is happening or what has happened or what we want to happen. Will we have happiness? No, no, no. Joy is outside of all of that. And it has nothing to do with what's going on or what hasn't happened or what will happen. I want to read to you two definitions of joy. One comes from John Piper and one comes from Rick Warren. I just thought they were pretty good. John Piper says this, Joy is a good feeling in the soul. Not just from fleeting emotion. A good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as He, the Holy Spirit, causes us to see the beauty of Christ in His Word and in His work. It is a good feeling of the soul produced by the Holy Spirit, not produced by an individual, not produced by a circumstance, not produced by something happening, but it's produced by the Holy Spirit. It's even a fruit, right, of the Holy Spirit. I love what Rick Warren says. This takes it just on a a different level, that joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all things. God is in control. He is in control of all the details of my life. It is the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right and the determined, listen to this, choice to praise God in every situation. I'm going to read that again because just a few people got it. Joy (laughs) is the settled assurance that God is in control of all details of my life. Not a person, not a president, not a national thing going on, not my bank account, not my IRA, not my job, not my family. God is in control 
of all things. And it's a quiet confidence, not a boastful running around crazy telling us how confident you are. It's a quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. And listen to this, the determined choice, choice to praise God in every situation. Wow. So you can clap. That's good. So joy is a choice in that we choose to participate in it. We choose to praise God in every situation. We choose, could I say, to praise God this year. What for? Not what's happening, but who he is and what he's done. But there's a tension of joy, isn't there? There's a tension. And the tension is choosing to praise God when there's nothing in my life or nothing in me that wants to praise him because I'm not happy. Well, I'm just here to tell you, you don't got to be happy to have joy. Right? The tension is, is that, God, I, I, I've done everything you've told me to do, but I'm not happy. But it isn't working out. But people are doing this. But it's a tension between what we want and what God wants, us listening to God and yet waiting on God to do his thing. There's this tension of joy, and I think we discover joy in the tension of life. I think that joy is kind of like this candle that burns in the darkness. Right? St. Francis made a statement to the degree that said that all the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the flame of a single candle. Darkness does not overwhelm light. Light scatters the darkness. Anne Frank said this. Anne Frank was profound. She's like 12 or 13, and she has some very profound thoughts. She spent 25 months in hiding from the Nazis, and she ended up dying of typhus in Germany. She wrote a diary, which many of us have read, and she heard on a Dutch radio broadcast that they wanted people to write diaries and keep notes so they could preserve the history of what was going on. So she went back and began to edit her own diary so that one day you and I could know what was going on. And at 12 or 13, sitting in a secret annex in a warehouse, sharing a home with other people, the windows had to be blacked out so nobody knew that they were there. There were periods of the day that they couldn't even move for fear of people hearing them. They lived behind a bookcase, right? Everything had to be brought to them. And she writes this, look at how a single candle can both defy and define the darkness. Look at how a single candle can both defy and yet define the darkness. Hey, have you ever just looked at a single candle in the darkness? Sometimes I sit in my office and I just, I turn all the lights off and everybody's gone and I just light this little bitty candle and just stare at it because it provides perfect, not perfection, <laughs> focus, perspective. There's a sense of calm, a sense of peace that kind of comes over when you can focus on a singular thing that all the, the darkness and the situations and the pressures of life kind of can close down in on you, but that light seems to flicker and keep going. It's, to me, a symbol of joy and the tension that is involved in this. This story that we're in, especially chapter 3, we begin to see the tension unfold. Last week, we ended with peace. God is providing. God is moving. They are in the harvest season. She just so happened to come into Boaz's field. God, the providence of God. Chapter 3 opens up, and the harvest season is beginning to end. What are Naomi and Ruth going to do? Now, we always know more than the characters know in this story. So we can't just assume that Ruth and Naomi know the end. God's like, here, I'm going to take you all through this, but don't worry. This is going to happen over here. No, no, no. They're always like waiting on God wondering if God's going to do what he said, if God's going to be faithful. So we know more than they do. They've not read Ruth 4 yet, okay? <laughs> and so it opens up with this. One day, Naomi says to Ruth, hey, my daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you'll be provided for. Harvest season is coming to end. Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight, he'll be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now, do as I tell you. Listen to this. Take a bath, put on perfume, and dress in your nicest clothes. Then go to the threshing floor, but don't let Boaz see you until he's finished eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. Ruth, I will do everything you say. So she went down to the threshing floor that night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. 
Now, I don't know about you, but if you were watching this movie with your family and it gets to this part of the story and you've got kids there, you might like, hey, let's press the pause button here and you kids go to bed. We'll finish this later. (laughs) Have you ever just took a look at the book of Ruth and Naomi's uh, instructions and advice to her and thought, yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know if I'd give my own daughter that piece of advice. Or maybe just like, the Bible's wonderful and it's pure and they never talk about anything that is questionable. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Right? Like, are you kidding me? The Bible spares no expense to show the humanity and how God works in spite of it. Now, Naomi's not doing anything that you or I wouldn't do. Naomi's thinking about it. She knows what's going on. After the harvest season, what are you and I going to do, Ruth? How are we going to eat? We can't get jobs. We're widows. We're unemployable. We, we have no status in society. We're at the bottom rung of society. As a matter of fact, Ruth, you're a Moabite. You're a foreigner. You're even in a worse position than I am. So I've got to take it upon myself to ensure that you've got a place to stay so that nothing happens to you. And maybe, just maybe, that'll benefit me as well. So Naomi starts to think, how do I work this out? Don't forget, chapter 2. As it so happened, Ruth found herself in Boaz's field. As it so happened, he cared for her and loved her and protected her. As it so happened, he invited her to the table. As it so happened, he told his workers, hey, throw extra food on the ground. They'll provide for you. So God's been providing, but Naomi's like, okay, God, you've been doing the as it so happens, and that's wonderful. That's great. But I don't like trusting in as it so happens. Anybody else? You ever been there where like God's been faithful, he's been good, but your back is against the wall and he's not really working on your timetable and it's come and due and you're thinking, God, I need you to do something. I need it as it so happened. But while you're thinking about the as it so happened, God, here's my idea. You ever think for God and give him options? Right? You ever think, God, you know, I I just want to be really on top of it. I want to be efficient. I got this plan. I think it'll work. So this is my idea. God, I'm just going to go for it and yeah, thank you. Thank you. You didn't say yay or nay, so I'm, I'm doing it. I think that's kind of what Naomi's doing here. She's like, okay, we know Boaz is the family redeemer, and we really, really, really need him to redeem us because we are going to be destitute. I got it, Ruth. Here's my idea. This is where the questionable advice comes in. Ruth, Boaz is a good man. He's been providing for you, but Ruth, I mean, come on. You've been working in the fields. You're dirty. You're sweaty. You're wearing your your work clothes. Tonight, they're going to be at the threshing floor. And you know what the threshing floor was? That's the end of the harvest season. This is like the docks. And there are migrant workers that Boaz is paying. These are seasonal workers. And I don't know if you've been around like seasonal workers. They're really, you know, they're like fishermen, okay? Like they're they're rough people. They're just coming to make money, and they get paid at the end. So the threshing floor, the end of the harvest season, they've worked hard. They've been slaving away. Now they get paid. Now it's time to party. Now it's time to blow off some steam. Okay, and it's been in a famine for 10 years, and now they're going to make some profit, and Boaz is going to be working the threshing floor all night so he can maximize his profit. It's been a good year. This is the environment that Naomi sends Ruth into, and she says, okay, you need to take a bath. You need to put on some good clothes. You need to do your hair. You need to put on some perfume, Ruth. I mean, come on. Maybe you've never seen this story this way, but let's think about it for a moment, and then what I want you to do. Make sure you go after Boaz has eaten and drank. And after he's fallen asleep, sneak down to the threshing floor. Sneak down to the docks. I want you to find where he's sleeping. Pick up his cover. Lay at his feet. And when he wakes up, he'll tell you what to do. (laughs) Think about that. Would you give that advice to your daughter or your children? (laughs) Absolutely not. Right? Trying to... Something happened. So Ruth's like, I will do whatever you say, Naomi. I love you. I'm for you. I recognize we're going to be in a destitute situation. We've got to do whatever we can. I want you to also see this. They're not just being crazy. They're not just being foolish. They are incredibly in a vulnerable situation. They are surviving. They're surviving. And when you need to survive, you will do almost whatever it takes to survive. The question is, what kind of man is Boaz? What kind of man is Boaz? What is he going to do? How's he going to take this situation? How's he going to act with Ruth now that she's all prettied up and perfumed and lying at his feet in the middle of the night? Well, it tells us. Hope I'm not ruining the story for you, but, you know. (laughs) 
Verse 7, after Boaz had finished eating and drinking, he was in good spirits, and he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain. Could I suggest to you that he wasn't drinking water, okay? <laughs> and went to sleep. Then Ruth came in quietly. Just imagine this. She's sneaking in the threshing floor. Maybe there's other people there sleeping. She's tiptoeing around. Yep, that's Boaz. <laughs> Waiting for him to wake up. Then Ruth... Around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. Hello, wouldn't you be? He said, who are you? Can you imagine that happened to you? You wake up in the middle of the night, there's a woman at your feet, or someone you don't know, right? She says, I am your servant, Ruth. She replied, spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. You're like, huh? So we, we just talk about the, the, the interesting advice or, you know, the questionable advice that Naomi has given Ruth. And Ruth follows it to the letter. But here's the thing I want you to know about Ruth and Naomi. They're not trying to trick Boaz. They're not trying to put Boaz in such a morally compromising situation that he gets her pregnant and they have a shotgun wedding and he's got no choice but to redeem her. They're not trying to trick him. Like I said, I just think they're surviving. And I'm taking a little bit of liberty here. I'll give you that. I think they're just doing what they know to do, what they think is right, in order to be redeemed so that they can survive and they can claim this promise that God has given them. I I think we find ourselves in that position a lot. We need God to do what he said he's going to do, and we need to do it right now so we come up with our plan of how that's going to happen, right? God, I I need you to be faithful. I I just need you to do what you said you're going to do. So I'm going to do everything I can to ensure, maybe force your hand, to do what you need to do. And you need to know that what Ruth is asking Boaz is not, will you sleep with me? But will you redeem me? Will you marry me? She said, would you cover me? You can look in the Old Testament that God said he put his covering over the people of Israel and he redeemed them. She's saying, will you save me? Will you redeem me? Will you marry me. She's putting her life in his hands because he's the only one that can redeem her and take her from being destitute to being whole. That's how vulnerable she is. She places himself at her mercy. She is even calling into question her her character, her sense of being a woman. The question is, what what is Boaz going to do? How's he going to respond? Because he's in the position of power here. And this is what Boaz says. Verse 10. He says, the Lord bless you, my daughter. There were probably a lot of men in Boaz's field that would not have said, the Lord bless you, my daughter, if they woke up and Ruth was at their feet at night. Lord bless you, my daughter. You are showing even more family loyalty now than you did before. For you've not gone after a younger man, whether rich or poor. Now don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary, for everyone in town knows that you're a virtuous woman. But while it is true that I am one of your family redeemers, there's another man who's more closely related to you than I am. Stay here tonight, and in the morning I'll talk to him, and if he's willing to redeem you, very well, let him marry you. But if he's not, then surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. Now lie down here until morning. When Boaz awakes and finds her there, and she says, I'm your servant, I think at this point in the story we can kind of assume that maybe... They, th- they like each other. I don't think that Ruth is trying to use Boaz at all. I think that Boaz genuinely cared for her and wanted to ensure that she and her mother-in-law were okay. They, they have begun to maybe even form a bit of an attraction for one another, but, but I want you to see what Boaz does. Because Ruth's a foreigner. She's a Moabite. She doesn't have rights in that culture. She really, really, really is at his mercy. He says, listen, my daughter. The first thing that he does in this scenario is he affirms her identity as a daughter of God. Ruth, this is who you are. You're not a Moabite anymore. You notice in the first two chapters that she's Ruth the Moabite, the Moabite, the foreigner. Now she's a daughter. My daughter. You're a daughter of God. Your identity is in him first. You have value. You have meaning. I know I just found you at my feet. You have perfume, you look good, you smell good, all that stuff. And then he says, and everyone knows that you're a virtuous woman. What he does next is he affirms her character, and he preserves her character. 
This is who you are, Ruth. This is what I appreciate about you. You're a daughter of God, and you are a virtuous woman, and everyone knows it, and I will not do anything to call that into question, to compromise you or to compromise this situation. Wow. Boaz is a good dude, isn't he? You know, there's something interesting about Boaz that just hit me yesterday. Because you have to wonder, why is it that he was so drawn to Ruth? Well, because God made him. Well, okay, I'll go with you. And I'm gonna, go with me for a moment. When you read the lineage of Jesus, it says that Boaz's mother was Rahab. Rahab was a foreigner. Not only that, she was a prostitute in Jericho. She's the lady whose house the spies went to. Is it possible that Boaz had a category, a place in his heart because of who his mother was, that he was compassionate towards those who were not from the same place that he was from? Is it, is it possible that he had an extra sense of compassion and, and his heart was drawn to women who found themselves in vulnerable situations, not to take advantage of them, but to look out for them? I'm going on a limb here, but I'm just wondering if that plays a role. So that when he sees Ruth... He remembers his mother. And he says, you're a daughter of God because my mother didn't belong either. She's a daughter of God. You're a daughter of God. Hey, and you're virtuous. I think by this time, Ruth is like, oh, yeah. That's where we would be too. Because isn't it so amazing that when God finds us and we're on the outside because of all the things that we've done, he says, listen, my son. Listen, my daughter. And he brings us in. And he doesn't push us away and say, I can't believe that you did all of this to try to get to me. I can't believe that the questionable advice and plan you put together. Because I'm sure if Naomi had gone to the Lord and said, hey, what do you think about this? He probably would have given her a bit of a different way to approach Boaz. But aren't you thankful that God doesn't reject us in our attempt to try to get to him and present him with ideas? That he finds us potentially in a morally compromising situation or whatever the case may be. And he says, this is who you are. I will redeem you. Does it really matter how we get to him as long as we come to him? And what we come to him with, he takes it. And we're like, thank you, thank you, God. And then the twist. Here's the tension now. Because we love the part, I will redeem you. And he says, yeah, Ruth, uh, I'll redeem you, but there's a little bit of uh, a problem here. There's another relative who's closer than me. And it's, he has first rights to redeem you and redeem your land and all of that. Do you think that Ruth's heart sunk a little bit in that moment? <gasps> oh, I, I don't know this man. Will he be as kind to me as you were? Will he care for Naomi in the same way? Or does he just want me because he wants the land and he wants the... It, it, I think it's that tension of joy. I mean, her heart goes... Phew! because of everything that's happening, and then now she has to wait. Now her life is going to be fully in the decision that this guy makes and that Boaz makes. Her destiny is really in the hands of Boaz. It's out of her hands. She's done everything that she can do, and now she has to wait for God, for Boaz to come through. Think about that. Isn't that the situation we all find ourselves in? Have you, ever, have you ever just said, you know what, God, I, I, I've done everything that I can do, and, and blah, 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 and now I'm just waiting for you to do your part? I'm just, I'm just waiting, and we're, and we're in the waiting. You know, well, God works, we wait. God works, we wait. And that waiting is not fun. But I think that waiting is where joy is produced because it's easy to serve God when it's good. Right? It's easy to praise God when everything is just wonderful. Right? 2020 was supposed to be the year of perspective. 2020 vision. It was going to be amazing. And God says, you want perspective? You want vision? I'll give it to you, but it's not going to be how you want it. Can we choose to praise him in the midst of this? And, and you read on. After he says, I'll redeem you myself, but I got I to gotta, I gotta go take care of this, Ruth. And so Boaz says, it says this, that Ruth lay at Boaz's feet until the morning, but she got up before it was light enough for the people to recognize, so people wouldn't recognize her. And Boaz had said, no one must know that a woman was here at the threshing floor. (laughs) Proof positive, Naomi's advice was not good. (laughs) Right? Boaz like, Ruth, nobody can know you were here. Nothing happened. We know that, but they don't. (laughs) 
and they are going to think some things because this is a small town. So you got to get out of here. You got to go. But, but, he says, hey, bring your cloak here and spread it out. And he measured six scoops of barley into the cloak and placed it on her back and then, then returned to town. Hey, hey, Ruth, but before you go, I want to give you more. Some scholars believe it was up to 80 pounds worth of barley on her back. Think about this for a moment. This is the winnowed barley. This is his profit. It's 10 years of famine. He's a landowner. He don't make money pulling it out of the ground. He makes money selling it. How much money did he give Ruth there? How much profit did he give away there? Just because he didn't want her to be without. Wouldn't one scoop been enough? Six scoops. Take it back. He continued to give her more and more and more because he cared for her. She went there and said, will you redeem me? Not only did she walk away with a promise to redeem her, she walked away with more, more. That's like the grace of God, isn't it? We come to him with our contrived plans and all this kind of stuff, and he says, I'll redeem you, but let me give you more. Let me give you more. And so, and so, you get to, to verse 16. And don't forget, he had, to, he had to get her out because he didn't want to damage or compromise her reputation, and he didn't want to damage or compromise the whole process that she was in. So go, 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 go. So when Ruth went back to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, what happened, my daughter? Can you imagine Naomi? Do you think she slept a wink that night? She's probably thinking, oh, my God, what did I send Ruth into? This better work out. Oh, geez, our whole life depends on this very moment. So she is waiting with bated breath. What happened? And Ruth told Naomi everything Boaz had done for her. And she added, and he gave me these six scoops of barley and said, listen to this, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. If you're not careful, you can get so infatuated with Ruth in this story that you forget about Naomi. And you forget about how much she lost. Her husband, her sons, any chance at a grandchild and the family life, family name continuing, and now she's putting all of her energy and effort into Ruth to make sure she's okay, and God did not leave her behind. God ensured that she was taken care of as well. Her name was Naomi, which means my delight. Do you remember when she came back, what she told everybody she wanted to be called? Mara, call me bitter. God is ensuring you will not remain bitter, Naomi. Even in the midst of questionable advice. I will show you that I'm faithful and that I'm good. And that's why I need to watch a cozy Christmas because I got to preach the end of Ruth before, the, before chapter three. I've never preached the messages out of order. And it's so amazing to see the gift that God gives Naomi. It's a baby, by the way. It's a grandson. But hey, that's the kind of man that Boaz is. Ruth, I, I care about you, but I also care about your mother-in-law. It's amazing to think this to that God not only sees us, but he cares about us, no matter how in the background we are. And he'll provide for us, and he'll care for us, and he'll give us more, more. I'm not saying riches, or I'm not talking about money here. That may be the case. But he'll give us what we need, exactly what we need, more. And then she says this. She says, just be patient. Just be patient, Ruth, until we hear what happens. The man won't rest until he has settled things today. Ruth came back in the morning. Boaz told her, I will take care of you tomorrow. The tension. Now all they can do is wait. All they can do is wait to see what happens at the city gate that, that Boaz goes to to talk to this relative. But I love that he will not rest. The father and the son did not rest until Jesus came to redeem us. And then the scripture says that he sat down at the right hand of the Father after he made a sacrifice for you and me. But Ruth and Naomi find themselves excited and stuck in the tension between what if and what if, solely dependent upon God working. Can you imagine for a moment that your entire life was held in someone else's hand? Can you imagine for a moment that, that you could do everything right, everything you know to do, and you're still not in charge of how the end comes out? Can you imagine that if your eternity is not solely in your hands? You're like, come on, Josh, are you just being facetious? Yeah. 
We have more agency and control than Ruth and Naomi did, but we are in no more control of the outcome than they were. Isn't that the tension of joy? Isn't that the tension of our lives that you can do everything right? You can eat right. You can exercise. You can make all the best financial decisions. You can put your kids in the best environment, but you are still not going to escape what if. You're still not going to escape a tragedy. You're still not going to escape something that is out of your control, a death, a sickness. I'm not trying to, to speak it over you. I'm just saying life happens because we are out of control. Not crazy. We are not in control of everything. Let me say it that way. And we come to these moments where we find ourselves solely waiting on God to do what God said he would do. We say, God, I I tithed, I raised my kids right, I was in church, I did everything that you said to do, but why is it like this? I even gave you ideas, God. (laughs) I gave you plans, but. Or God, I, I did everything right except that one decision, and. God, I don't understand what's going on right now. I thought you were supposed to guarantee this. I thought you were supposed to never let a pandemic happen. I thought that, that if I prayed hard enough and someone told me this person would be elected, then, then everything would be okay. And we put our hope and our happiness and our joy in things that are out of our control when God said it has never mattered what was going on around you. Joy is always found in me by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit produced in you. I think that's the tension of Christmas. God hadn't spoken in 400 years. They need freedom, deliverance from the Roman Empire. They're looking for a king. They want to destroy the Romans. And God says, okay, I'll give you a baby. And he'll be born in a nondescript town in a field. Think about this for a moment. Joseph and Mary couldn't find a place, not because, maybe because it was overrun and there's no vacancy, or maybe just, they had family. Maybe just maybe their family says, yeah, we're not really buying the fact, you two are not really married, you're just betrothed, you're engaged, and Mary's pregnant, and she says God made her pregnant. Yeah, uh, we don't want to ruin our own reputation by having you in our house. I think maybe possibly that's an example, that's a possibility, I should say. They find themselves out in the same fields where Ruth and Boaz met one another. This whole story takes place in Bethlehem. Joseph and Mary come through the same gate that Boaz redeems Ruth. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, giving away cozy Christmas, but it's in the story. Ruth ends with a baby. Christmas begins with a baby. God says, here's a baby. I'm not looking for a baby. I'm looking for you to fix my situation. Oh, oh, God says it's right there. It's the baby. And I think about the wise men. They follow a star and they find a stable. Uh, Who knows what they were expecting, but they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, When's the last time you went to the hospital when some baby was born, you brought him money? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They were expecting something different, but they found a baby, but they gave the very best they had to this baby. God sent a candle into the world. He didn't send this nuclear bomb that illuminated the entire world. He sent a little bitty flickering candle in a little bitty town called Bethlehem with just a bunch of nondescript shepherds seated around there. It makes me think of what what Anne Frank said. Look at how a single candle can both defy and define the darkness. That's what a candle does. St. Francis, all the darkness in the world cannot snuff out the single flame or flicker of a candle. That candle burns and burns and burns, and it defies the darkness around it, but it defines it as well. You have a candle on your seat or under your seat or somewhere close. Here in a moment, ushers are going to come. They're going to light the candle on the end, and then you're going to pass it down and light each other's candle. After your candle is lit, 
I want you to stand up. And I want you to focus on the candle. And I want you to think to yourself how it both defies and defines the darkness, not just in this room, but in your lives, in this season, in whatever is going on. So as I said, after that candle is lit, would you stand with me? And we will sing together as we look at this candle in front of us and reflect on what this means in this season and what this means going forward.
verse together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy that is our strength. Even if our situations don't change today, there is joy that is found in you. It is a quiet confidence. Is it, assur- it is an assurance that you are ultimately in control of the details of our lives. That confidence that everything will work out because you are working those things out. It is the choice to praise you. May we praise you in this season. May we discover the joy that is being uh, produced in the tension that is already there by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I just pray that this Christmas season, Father, may, because of you, it be one of the most memorable. May you do, as Paul said in Ephesians, exceedingly and abundantly above anything that we could ask for or imagine at the power that is at work within us, and that is the power of Jesus. Be with us as we gather Lord, I pray that you'd be with us even if we're just online, wherever we're at right now, that we would sense that presence, that that joy that is in our soul. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending us the person of Jesus as a baby because he's Emmanuel and he was God with us and he knows what it is to be in the tension as well. He knows everything that we go through for he went through it. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you just help us see Jesus right now. See him in this, in this candle. Feel him in the tension. And I pray that you would use us as the light. That wherever we go with the light of Jesus in us, that we would defy the darkness around us and we would define it as well. That we would choose to be followers of Christ. We would choose to speak of him and his hope and his restoration and his salvation and bring joy into seasons and situations where there is no joy. So we thank you for being the light of the world and using us to be candles wherever we go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas. We'll see you in the new year. Hey, thanks for joining us online today. If you're new here or you made the decision to follow Jesus, we would love to connect with you and let you know how to take your next steps. Real quick, text NEW TO FAITH to 97000 and someone from our team will get in touch with you soon. You can also visit our website at faithcommunity.co to learn more about the church and stay in touch on social media. Shoot us a DM over on Facebook or Instagram if you have any questions and you can even share the service with your friends. If you're joining us on YouTube, make sure you hit that red subscribe button and the bell icon so you're the first to know when new content is available. And hey, if there's anything going on in your life that you would like someone to pray with you about, please let us know. Email prayer at faithcommunity.co or submit a request through the app and someone from our team will pray specifically for you and your situation. Thanks again for being here today. We'll see you next time.